The Spectre of Communism in Hawaii, 1947-1953. to 1953. Chapter 3, Trouble in the Ranks. Writing for the Department of Labor in 1948, University of Hawaii Economics Professor James H. Shoemaker commented on the phenomenal growth of unions, particularly the ILWU, and the territory of Hawaii in the years immediately following World War II until 1944. Hawaii was one of the least organized areas in the United States, Shoemaker said, but within two years it had become one of the most highly organized areas. With this rapid growth, internal stresses were inevitable. Within the ILWU, the issue of communism became a significant cause for stress and for some, a convenient tool for an oblique approach to other issues. Ascribing motivation for a man's anti-communist stance is a difficult and dangerous proposition, with man's immense powers of rationalization, it is this writer's opinion that the primary actors would have found it difficult to make an objective analysis of their own motivations. This factor creates a serious problem in analyzing the events surrounding the so-called Ignacio Revolt and the establishment of the Union of Hawaiian Workers, UHW. On Sunday, December 14, 1947, Amos Ignacio, Vice President of the Hawaii Division of the United Sugar Workers, ILWU Local 142, announced to the executive board of that division that he was leaving the ILWU and that Unit 6 at Pepikeo, Island of Hawaii, was leaving with him. The minutes of that meeting quote Ignacio, who was also a member of the territorial legislature, as follows, I want to be a free man and want no part of communism. In the interest of the workers in the plantations, we will set up an independent union. I realize that we are going to run on rough sailing with the ILWU out to destroy us. I realize that there are other units that would like to take the same stand. Asked if there was any proof of communist domination of the ILWU other than the Izuka pamphlet, Ignacio said that he, himself, had been approached to join the Communist Party and had refused. David Thompson, ILWU International Representative, replied, This comes as a great shock to me. Rumors have been going around about communism, but in spite of these rumors that I have heard, I, as International Representative, have been working here trying to help the people of this island. I have not given these rumors much credence. I have had differences of opinion in the past with Brother Ignacio, but I thought we were working along an honest program. This action is going to destroy the labor movement in the territory if you are successful. The ILWU is not going to sit down. This is going to be taken to the membership. As an independent union, your units will have some favors for a couple of years, until the employers can succeed in destroying the union here. You must realize the power the international has given you. I don't see how you can take this step in honesty. You are not representing the wishes of the rank and file. Communism is not the issue. It is a weapon that the bosses are using to destroy the unions and the territory. But, if that is the issue, you are off the beam. The ILWU is not a communist organization. It may be that some ILWU members are communists, but the program of the ILWU is what the people make it. As the meeting continued, the conversation became increasingly personal and Thompson became more distressed. If Amos asks me if I am a communist, Thompson stated at one point, I will tell him it's none of his business. Do you think that if I'm a communist, then I'm not a good American? I fought in the last war for America and have a wooden leg now. The meeting of the executive board took three hours and twenty minutes that Sunday morning in December 1947, and Ignacio was unwavering. He refused to delay his announcement, even though Yasuki Arakaki had requested that the international representatives be given a chance to speak with the rank and file. We will operate as an independent union as of tomorrow morning, Ignacio declared. Footnote, ILWU Local 142, Minutes, December 14, 1947, p. 9. In an interview with the author on March 13, 1975, David Thompson, who served as the ILWU's educational director for many years, commented on some of the reasons for Ignacio's departure from the Union. Thompson believed that Ignacio, as a member of the territorial legislature, was under pressure to maintain respectability and be well thought of by the prominent people in the community. Ignacio's pride was hurt when the ILWU sugar locals were consolidated, causing him to lose his position as president of the union and only settling for a vice presidency in the newly amalgamated union. Footnote end. The next day's Hilo Tribune Herald reported the story, in somewhat exaggerated form, in its headline, 4,000 Bolt ILWU Ranks. The article emphasized that Ignacio was a highly respected union leader and a two-term member of the Territorial House of Representatives. Ignacio was quoted as saying, There have been no denials of communism in the ILWU. 
Ignacio resonated with many by condemning the type of thinking represented by International Vice President J. R. Robertson, who had recently been quoted as saying to the rank and file, there are smart bosses, but there are no good bosses. In Honolulu, the ILWU leadership downplayed the Ignacio revolt while developing their strategy. However, on the island of Kauai, Ignacio found an ally in George Aguirre. It appeared that the Union of Hawaiian Workers might become a viable, territory-wide organization. Aguirre had gained notoriety in the spring of 1947 as a newly elected Democratic member of the Territorial House of Representatives by breaking an 18-day organizational deadlock by voting for the Republican candidate for Speaker of the House. Now, Aguirre announced his resignation from the Democratic Party and stated that he chose December 15, 1947, the day after Ignacio's bombshell, to make his announcement in support of his fellow legislators' bold act. Aguirre protested the control of Kauai's Democratic Party organization by ILWU leaders like Slim Shimizu and Robert Kunimura, claiming they are only interested in controlling the local party for their own purposes and for those of their leaders in Honolulu. Aguirre revealed that the same leaders were responsible for his decision in the last legislature. I have never made any statement regarding how I reached the decision to vote to break the deadlock in the recent legislature. I can say now that the reason I did was because I was given undeniable proof that the Democratic delegation in the House were communists. I might add that, as a result of being presented with the facts regarding communism in Hawaii, the Isuka pamphlet was no surprise to me. Amos Ignacio quickly followed up on the opening George Aguirre had given him. In the next day's Hilo Tribune Herald, Ignacio was quoted as saying, I have always considered Kauai to be the stronghold of the ILWU in the territory, and I believe the desire of Kauai workers to withdraw from the ILWU is proof that the union has outlived its usefulness in Hawaii. Either Ignacio was trying to fill an inside strait or he did not realize how isolated Aguirre was on Kauai. Robert Kunimura, president of ILWU Local 149, called Ignacio's statement a bold-faced lie and produced a statement signed by every local unit official on Kauai, including Fred Izuka, who was president of the American Factors Unit at Hana Pepe and the brother of Akiro Izuka. The Honolulu advertiser saw a great future in the Union of Hawaiian Workers, founded by Ignacio. The advertiser saw the dawn of a new era in Hawaii's labor relations in which employer and employee meet on a basis of mutual respect and trust, each realizing that one is necessary to the other. It should mean that, together, the employer and employee may go forward to the ultimate goal of security for all in a future the possibilities of which we do not dream at present. The ILWU quickly reasserted itself. Jack Hall, the regional director, returned from a three-day executive board meeting of the International in San Francisco on December 19, 1947 and announced that the ILWU had reversed its decision of July 1947 and would now comply with anti-communist provisions of the Taft-Hartley Acts. It will not be our purpose to be isolated from the mainstream, Hall told reporters upon his return to Honolulu. Hall also wrote a letter to the rank and file membership of the ILWU in Hawaii stating that he was not a member of the Communist Party, adding, The writer's denial that he is a member of the Communist Party will not put a stop to the circulation of lies and our membership must expect it to continue. Hall's enemies were already demanding that he state not only that he was not a member of the Communist Party at that time, but that he had never been a member. The ILWU chose the Hilo Armory for a unity conference on January 3rd to 5th, 1948, looking for a showdown. International President Harry Bridges suggested a variety of issues for discussion, only one of which was whether Hawaii's sugar workers preferred to be represented by an independent union. On that question, Bridges suggested a secret ballot to resolve the issue. At first, Ignacio accepted Bridges' offer with certain conditions. One, the conference must be for sugar workers only. Two, there should be no interference from San Francisco. And three, the secret ballot should be supervised by the National Labor Relations Board, not the ILWU. Ignacio was also skeptical about Bridges' move to open the conference to the press and wanted the issue of communism to be debated openly at the conference. But clearly, the ILWU did not plan to run the Unity Conference for the benefit of Amos Ignacio and the Union of Hawaiian Workers. Ultimately, Ignacio did not attend the conference, although the vice president of the UHW, Akoni Puel, did attend. Louis Goldblatt was on hand from the international office in San Francisco. Non-sugar leaders such as Harry Kamoku and Bert Nakano of Hilo's Longshoremen and Ernest Arena, president of ILWU Local 150, were very much in evidence. As described by Tom O'Brien, a conservative radio announcer and correspondent to the Honolulu Advertiser, Antonio Rania, head of the recently amalgamated Sugar Local 142, gave the delegates the true pitch right from the start. I thought I'd be in the Battle of the Bulge when I flew to Hilo after Ignacio's revolt. 
Rania said. I'm in a tight spot, so I called the best man on the coast to come and help me, Brother Louis Goldblatt. Goldblatt was responsible for one of the most important decisions of the Unity Conference. He convinced many reluctant Union leaders that Izuka should be allowed to appear before the delegates to plead his case. In a letter requesting the right to appear, Izuka stated, As author of the pamphlet, the truth about communism in Hawaii, I have been slandered and lied about by certain ILWU officials who are attempting to discredit me and the facts contained in my pamphlet in the eyes of rank and file sugar workers. I have been called a moron, renegade, self-confessed liar, and other uncomplimentary names. I believe sincerely that the real issue facing the sugar workers of Hawaii is communist domination, both here and on the west coast, and no smokescreen should be raised at this time to the cloud the issue. I am in Hilo to present my side of the story to the Unity Conference, and to answer the lies and slander directed at me. Your international officers have publicized the ILWU as the most democratic union in the United States. Now is the time to prove whether this is true or false. How well or how badly Izuka performed at the Unity Conference is largely dependent upon the prejudices of the observer. One thing is certain, Izuka was operating in hostile territory. The Maui News reported that Izuka stood alone facing a constant barrage of questions, accusations, catcalls, laughs, and mockery. He spoke to the delegates for about 45 minutes on global communism for the past 20 years, making little reference to his pamphlet or matters of local concern. When he did get around to his pamphlet, he admitted there had been a ghost writer working with him, but refused to divulge his identity. This was clearly not satisfactory to the delegates. At one point during the question and answer session, a delegate jumped to his feet and asked, Mr. Izuka, do you know my name? Izuka replied that he recognized the face but could not remember the name. My name, Mr. Izuka, is Thomas Yagi, and I was one of those mentioned in your pamphlet. Yagi, a sugar worker from Maui, was reported in the Izuka pamphlet to have been asked to join the Communist Party by a fellow union member, but he declined on religious grounds. Yagi now denied that he was ever asked by anyone to join the Communist Party. He challenged Izuka to explain how he came by the story he told in his pamphlet. Izuka replied that he was told the story by Yashikazu Morimoto. Morimoto then rushed to the speaker's podium and denied the whole thing. In the eyes of Tom O'Brien, a friendly observer, Izuka's performance looked as follows. Frankly, most of his discussion about communism itself was far over the heads of the delegates. He spoke of the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx, and the international intrigue of the Kremlin. It was all above the grasp of the little delegates, and the big ones pretended they did not understand. When Izuka asked for questions, the real inquisition started. Questions like, is it legal to be a communist? Will the communists overthrow the USA? By force, when you were a communist, did you plan any sabotage? Came fast and tricky. According to O'Brien, it was soon obvious that Jack Hall and Louis Goldblatt were engineering the entire inquisition. O'Brien left the Hilo armory that evening with the conviction that Izuka had really won. He had stood up in the midst of his enemies, unafraid, and had done a good job. Few of the delegates shared O'Brien's view, and it is difficult for this writer to understand O'Brien's definition of tricky, based on the examples he used. Izuka's credibility suffered its greatest setback when he was asked to name a Communist Party program in the ILWU. When he responded that a strike could disrupt the government and destroy the democratic system, the boos were deafening. In an interview with this writer on June 21, 1973, Akiro Izuka repeated his complaints that the question and answer session during his presentation at the Unity Conference was manipulated by Goldblatt, McElrath, Hall, and Steve Murin. According to Izuka, they had been admitted into the conference by means of fraudulent press credentials from the Japanese-language newspaper, Nippu Jiji. Footnote, Murin was not directly associated with the ILWU, but he was close to many union members. In 1947, at the age of 29, Murin arrived in Hawaii from Boston, where he had been a student at Boston University on the GI Bill. His primary occupation was as a full-time student at the University of Hawaii, from which he received his BA degree in 1951. However, Murin gained notoriety in the community for his leading role in the establishment of the Hawaii Civil Liberties Committee, HCLC, in response to the plight of John and Aiko Rieneki. In a 1973 interview, Murin described himself as a radical left-winger in 1948 and a member of the Young Communist League in Pennsylvania, where he grew up. His first wife, Bessie Steinberg, was once identified as an officer of the Communist Party in Pennsylvania before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Murin declined to comment on whether he was a member of the Communist Party in Hawaii, 
but there is no doubt that he was at least sympathetic with its philosophy and objectives. Since 1951, Nuren has been an employee of the United Public Workers, UPW. It was called the United Public Workers of America until 1953 when it was expelled from the CIO due to communist influences. This information was obtained from a personal interview with Steve Nuren on June 7, 1973. Footnote end. Izuka attended the Unity Conference for the purpose of defending himself, not for supporting Amos Ignacio. Izuka claimed that he first spoke with Ignacio about the Union of Hawaiian Workers at lunch on the same day he appeared before the Unity Conference and saw no driving ambition in Ignacio. He said Ignacio had ignored the positive appeals the ILWU could make to workers and offered a negative program. Izuka was never associated with the UHW. There were propaganda efforts on both sides during the Unity Conference. In December 1947, the ILWU issued a 23-page pamphlet called The Mysterious Stranger. The pamphlet claimed that a retired newspaper editor named Lee Edelson, who was a product of the Hearst organization, was an expert at red baiting, race baiting, and labor wrecking. Edelson's advice to bosses was to weaken the union from within and isolate workers from their leadership. He suggested that the bosses find some ex-communist, give him some money and put his name on a pamphlet and be sure to expose every militant leader as a red. The ILWU claimed that the events of the past month and a half were nothing more than a boss's plot. The conclusion of The Mysterious Stranger was subtitled Nailing the Lies. One of the lies it sought to nail down was the claim that the international officers were outsiders, reds, and agitators. However, the response ignored the question of whether the international officers were reds. The ILWU's rhetoric portrayed the boss's plot, but also effectively outlined the progress of Hawaii's workers under the ILWU's leadership. Among the organizations supporting Ignacio's departure from the ILWU was the American Legion. The Legion distributed 500 copies of an open letter to Jack Hall to the delegates at the ILWU Unity Conference. The letter asked the rank and file if Hall had ever told them that the Roberts report on Pearl Harbor, which called Hall a communist, was a lie. The letter also asked if Hall was ever a member of the Communist Party, whose avowed purpose was to destroy unions in order to successfully destroy the United States. The Roberts Report refers to a report compiled by a special commission under the leadership of Supreme Court Justice Owen J. Roberts. The commission was formed in the wake of the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor in December 7, 1941 to determine responsibility for America's inadequate response to the attack. The report itself is only 21 pages long and was submitted secretly to President Franklin D. Roosevelt and contained no mention of communism. In the spring of 1947, the U.S. government declassified and released 39 massive volumes of material related to the proceedings of the commission, including an enormous amount of raw data accumulated by the FBI. Volume 25 of the material included a chart prepared by the FBI that listed the Central Committee of the Communist Party in Hawaii and 24 organizations deemed sympathetic to communism, as well as several communist front organizations and two ILWU locals that were alleged to be infiltrated by communists. In 1947, the American Legion claimed that the Roberts Report had been published for six years, which was misleading. Governor Steinbeck said in December 1947 that he doubted anyone outside of intelligence departments and their superiors in Honolulu knew about the report's contents prior to early that year. The mention of the report in the context of naming members of the Communist Party in Hawaii and sympathetic organizations implicated many innocent people. An ILWU pamphlet entitled The Big Lie sought to deal with the Roberts Report in an interesting fashion as the rank and file was being urged by anti-communists to rid itself of Jack Hall on the basis of his appearance in the infamous document. Should they follow this course, their next move must be to seek the dismissal of Circuit Court Judge A.M. Christie. Judge Christie is listed in the Roberts Report as being a member of a German propaganda agency and is listed in FBI Char XVI with a code number of 100-1559. They must also ask for the Chamber of Commerce to drop from membership several prominent individuals in the territory's business world, such as Guido Giacometti, mill superintendent of the Allah Sugar Company, and his son Luigi, who are listed in FBI Chart 17 as members of Italian Observation and Listening Posts. The senior Giacometti's FBI number is 100-1538, and his son's number is 100-1539. Ingram Steinbeck has not suggested that the American Legion remove from its membership roles a man listed by the FBI as an advisor to the Japanese consul in Honolulu immediately prior to Pearl Harbor. FBI Chart 3 lists an ex-Legion official and high officer of the Boy Scouts, Wade Warren Thayer, as a member of the Advisory Council of Nagao Kido, consul of the Imperial Japanese government. Thayer's FBI number is 100-617. 
the governor has not requested that the royal brewery fire its brewmaster walter glockner whose name appears on fbi char xvi with a number of sixty five and fifteen and so the charges and counter charges continued however the ilwu left the unity conference at hilo intact on february twenty first nineteen forty eight amos ignacio was tried by the union in absentia and was found guilty of dereliction of duty and was expelled a gesture referred to with some justification as a farce in july the union of hawaiian workers was welcomed into the american federation of labor as sugar workers union federal local twenty four thousand four hundred five afl with john owens afl territorial representative remarking the workers of hawaii realize ilwcio leaders have not answered the big sixty four dollars question about communism the union of hawaiian workers was never a viable organization and not even the afl could breathe life into it on december tenth nineteen forty eight nine months after recognition the uhw was suspended by the afl and after losing a representation election at lapahoy hoy on january fourth nineteen forty nine the union amos ignacio had started scarcely a year before with such high hopes had died a quiet death 